It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. That is Isaiah 49.6. Uh, welcome to tonight's lesson on church history. Um, we see the, uh, the outworking of this passage in the, in the study, uh, in the time that we are, we are spending studying the, um, the spread of the gospel, the spread of the church, the spread of the kingdom of God. We see uh, in Scripture, in Old and New Testament, we see the unfolding of this gospel throughout uh, redemptive history, and then we see the outworking then of the gospel in the history of the church. We've looked the last couple weeks at how the church, the early church, dealt with much adversity. Uh, they dealt with heresy and, and false teaching in the church. They dealt with persecution from the government. That was one of the big things we talked about last week was the ways that the, uh, the church was, was oppressed and persecuted by Rome. Uh, we looked at how the church had been slandered by the society at large. We looked at how God raised up apologists and uh, people who would stand up for the faith and defend the faith. And today we are going to zoom out a little bit. We are going to kind of get a little bit out of order chronologically. We've been, last week we spent most of our time in the third century, that is in the 200s AD. We looked at, uh, we looked at sort of African Christianity. We looked at um, Carthage and Alexandria. We talked about Origen and Tertullian and, and Clement, some of these, um, these ancient, ancient fathers here. And uh, again, that was in the second, or the third century, the 200s, was what we looked at. We are going to finish up the, the 200s tonight, uh, but before that, like I said, we are going to zoom out and uh, kind of take a broad, uh, broad look at, at some topics and the way that some things developed here. Um, so I'll go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then we will get into our study. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given us to gather. Um, I thank you for the church um, I thank you for the, the church here at Grace and then uh, just the church that you've been building for, um, for many, many centuries, many, many generations. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful uh, to that which you call us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, the first thing that we are going to look at is a kind of thinking or a way of thinking about things. And, uh, and this is not a, an idea that is, that is original to me. Um, I'm, I couldn't tell you who for sure was the one who kind of used this as sort of the thread to tie some of these ideas in. I know it's one that uh, Dr. Robert Godfrey uh, speaks about frequently. He's uh, one, of my, one of my big sources that I use for this, uh, this study here. But um, hierarchical thinking. Hierarchical thinking. So that is thinking about life as a hierarchy was something that was uh, that was very common throughout church history, and it was something that started fairly early on and developed uh, throughout the centuries. And uh, if you think about it, particularly in Roman life, uh, ancient, ancient Roman life, ancient Greco-Roman life, all of society was structured in a hierarchy. That is, there's, there's different tiers, tiers of importance and, and things like that. So you have uh, the Roman political structure, for example. You have the emperor on top. You have uh, senators who are kind of below them. You have uh, an equestrian class or just wealthy, influential people below them. You have um, freemen below them, sort of the, the middle class. And then, of course, you have slaves sort of at the bottom rung. So to an ancient person, uh, hierarchy is just sort of the way that we think about the world. When you see someone, you're kind of thinking, okay, where am I in relation to them? Are they above me? Are they below me? Kind of where are we on this, um, this sort of thing? Uh, that, that, of course, was uh, just sort of the general social thinking, but uh, many things are structured in, an hierarchy, in a hierarchy. For example, the military was another common one. Being a soldier was a very common, um, very common thing for, uh, for people in the ancient world. And, uh, and we're, we're aware of different ranks within the military. For example, there are centurions that, uh, that Scripture speaks of who are captains over uh, 100 men. And, of course, those centurions would have had people that they reported to and people that reported to them. You can kind of see there's just there's this hierarchy. There's this um, sort of this, this power structure that is, that is there. And, again, the question is kind of where do we, where do we fit in with that? Um, and what, what's kind of interesting is, is people began to think, well, if, if all of life is a hierarchy, if society and, and government and military, all these things are, are a hierarchy, um, is not heaven sort of a hierarchy too? Uh, of course, uh, we see in Scripture, of course, God is, is on top, but we also see Scripture speaking of 
archangels and of angels, and, and we can sort of, you know, the Bible doesn't maybe give us the, the clearest answer to, you know, what, what are all the different tiers, but we can see that there is somewhat of a, of a hierarchical structure there uh, with heaven. And, uh, and when we continue that, that sort of line of thinking, we can think about that as applies to, um, to saints, to the saved in heaven. Of course, there are some people who are, um, you know, maybe very sanctified. We could think about like Ignatius or Irenaeus, you know, some of these great church leaders, many of them died as martyrs. And we can think, oh, this person was, you know, very, uh, very, very sanctified. And then, uh, you know, compare him to maybe the thief on the cross who kind of you know, just got in by the skin of his teeth, so to speak, right? He wasn't probably super sanctified by the time he, he made it to heaven. Well, of course, it seems kind of logical that there could be this, this sort of ranking system or this, um, this hierarchy with, with saints. Um, we as, as Americans are not incredibly hierarchical in the way that we think about things, um, but I, I think this still, I hope, can, can make sense to it, and I hope we can relate to it. Um, one, one example of a very hierarchical society today is uh, the culture in Korea. Uh, I had an exchange student when I was in high school who was Korean, and it's just interesting. They're just a much more, uh, they, they see things in hierarchy even down to age. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, the older people are worthy of more respect than the younger people. So if you go there, you, you, people will probably ask you how old you are to kind of, kind of figure that out. Um, you know, for example, if Josh and I were in Korea and uh, we were going to walk through the doorway, uh, I would, of course, let him go first, you know, being, being much older uh, than I. Uh, and this is, you know, this is just, this is the hierarchy. That's, that's, that's sort of how that works. And um, again, that's uh, very common in, in many cultures. Again, we're not so much that way. We're very democratic. That's just kind of part of our, uh, part of our American, uh, American heritage, I suppose there. Um, but we can, we can still see how this, uh, how this kind of thing would apply. Um, for, for example, if we're uh, maybe trying to get something done, we're trying to build a, a house or an expansion on a business or something like that, um, it might be helpful. Um, well, let, me, let me back up a minute here. There's a, a thing that, that always kind of goes along with, uh, with a hierarchy is the idea of a patron. Um, that is the idea of having, uh, you know, maybe you're down here on this middle tier and you have a friend who's a couple tiers above you. It, it really helps to have sort of those friends. And, and we can kind of think of that, uh, that was the example that I was going with, was uh, if we're, uh, say, say we want to build an expansion onto the church or something like that, it might be good for us to have somebody who is like on, you know, the zoning board or something like that. That is someone who has connections that we don't have, someone who outranks us in a certain, in a certain way who can, who can kind of get something done. This is the idea of patronage. Just there's someone who's higher up on the food chain that you can sort of employ to, um, to help you get the thing that you're, that you're trying to accomplish. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is the kind of thinking that, that would have been very common. It would have been uh, almost a presupposition to many ancient people, many ancient Christians. Um, and again, when, when we look around and we see that all of society is structured in this hierarchy, uh, it only makes sense then that the, the church would also be a hierarchy. And we see uh, this sort of hierarchy form within the church really over a number of centuries. This, none of this stuff was things that happened overnight. Like I said early on, today we are going to zoom out a little bit, and we're not just going to be looking at, at one century. Rather, we're going to kind of look at how some of these, uh, these, these ideas developed here. And uh, the, first, the first example that we are going to look at is the example of the bishop, uh, bishop is a word that's come up several times throughout our study so far. Um, if you remember, it was, uh, it was Ignatius who kind of in the, in the quest for truth, or excuse me, Irenaeus in the quest for truth, who said, you know, if you, if you really want to know what's true and certain, you know, go to your local trusted bishop. Um, and in the early centuries uh, of the church, particularly the, the first and even into the second century, um, this term bishop was, uh, was used basically to refer to a, a, a teaching pastor, a teaching elder. Um, we could say that in a, in a you know, sort of a first century sense, we could say that Josh is the bishop of, of this church. Um, that is, he is more often than not the guy who is preaching, opening the word of God from the pulpit, that sort of thing. Uh, well, this term would develop throughout, uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, and we get this word here, uh, bishop from episkopos or overseer. Um, if you have, uh, if you have an ESV, um, usually overseer is going to be the word that you will, that you will see there, but different translations of the Bible will render that differently. But another way to translate that is bishop. 
Um, now, the Bible also uses another word to describe what we would argue is the same thing, and that is the word presbuteros, which is where we get the word elder. And as you see in, uh, in Scripture, partic particularly uh, Titus 5, 1 Timothy 5, um, places like that, you see uh, these two words used interchangeably, elder and overseer. They refer to the same position. It's just sort of two different ways of saying the same, the same thing. Um, and so, so scripture sees these two words as the same thing, being interchangeable, and uh, the early church also saw these two things as being interchangeable, again, particularly in the first century or two of the church. Um, we had, what was that, week two, I think, that we talked about the letter of First Clement that was this very early um, book, or, or rather letter, and it was from the church or the elders of the church in Rome to the elders of the church in Corinth. And uh, that that's, was a very early text. It could be end of the first century, probably early second century. Um, but, but in that example, they use these words and they use them interchangeably. Um, a, an overseer is an elder, an elder is an overseer. Those are just two different ways of, of describing um, the same thing. Um, but towards the end of the second century, um, at least by uh, the year 180, we see um, something close to a universal splitting of these two roles. Um, so it's Again, seeing them as two roles rather than two words that describe the same role. Um, so by, uh, by around the year 180, it was quite universal, not certainly 100%, but, but quite universal or quite common anyway, to have uh, a church government that was structured in a sort of threefold ministry. A threefold ministry. So you'd have a bishop, and then below him you would have elders, and then below the elders you would then have deacons. That was sort of your, your pecking order or your, your structural order of the church there. Um, and part of that was um, sort of out of the, out of the need to, um, to guard against this, uh, this false teaching. Um, there was a need to trace our church back and our church teaching back to the apostles. And again, a, a lot of that was sort of in response to the Gnostic movement that we discussed several weeks ago. The Gnostic movement, the Gnostics were these, uh, these individuals who claimed to have secret or special knowledge um, that was, uh, you know, it was just, it was this secretive thing. And uh, one of the guards against that was the church saying, well, no, we can, we can trace our church back. We have, um, you know, this guy is our bishop now, and he succeeded this guy, and he succeeded this guy. And, um, you know, for example, we can trace back, uh, like Polycarp, we learned about a couple weeks ago, was a disciple of the Apostle John. So, so there was really a need to say, no, we're tracing our, our bishops back to the apostles. Now, in those early centuries, that wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't in a sense that we would think of, of apostolic succession today, if you're familiar with that doctrine, particularly if you grew up in uh, a Roman Catholic church. Um, you, would be, you would be familiar with that. Um, not in that sense, just in a sense of we are continuing this teaching that has been handed down from the apostles. That's the sense that the early church really sees this, uh, this role of the bishop or this role of, of succession there. Um, kind of like if you've, uh, some of the churches that I grew up in would have a wall sort of in the back of all the different pastors, you know, from all the different ages. If you've seen that, it's just, uh, again, not saying, at least in Protestant churches, not saying that these are successors to the apostles or something like that, but just saying, hey, here are the, you know, the faithful men who have served and, and led our, our flock, you know, since its, since its founding. Um, but um, let's see. All right. Another thing that's kind of interesting, just a note on this, um, another sort of offshoot of this, uh, this word uh, presbuteros is uh, the word priest would actually come from that too. Uh, the word priest um, and, uh, and again, it's, it's rooted in the same word, so we would say then that if, if we are going to use the word priest, um, at least in a, in a true biblical sense, priest is going to be right alongside here is this, this same thing. Same thing as an overseer, an elder, uh, or a priest. Uh, it wasn't something that was describing like a, sort of an Old Testament function of priest being someone who would, who would offer a sacrifice. Um, it was just another way of saying a presbyter or an elder. Uh, but of course, if you're familiar with kind of how things unfolded, um, you know, you look at, for example, the Roman Catholic Church today, and there's, you know, there's all these different ranks, and priest is just sort of one of those different ranks. It's, it's not a synonym here, it's a completely different function. It's a, it's a different, um, uh, uh, holds different authority. Um, so again, we see these things that are the same eventually um, being split apart to describe different roles. Uh, well, if we, if we continue this, 
this hierarchical thinking, this, this sort of this, this hierarchy of, of structures here, um, it, it would kind of seem like there are some bishops then who are more important than other bishops. Um, Certainly, we see, uh, again, going back to the letter of 1 Clement, where uh, the church in Rome writes to the church in Corinth. Now, R Rome, if you, if you would read that letter, Rome is not saying that they have some sort of, a, of an authority because their bishop is the successor to Peter or something like that. It's just, no, we're a big established church, and we have some wisdom to, to give you here. Um, and again, the context of that letter was that the ch Corinthian church had kicked out their elders, and the church in Rome was writing to them, appealing to them, saying, no, you need to reinstate your elders. You need to submit to uh, this authority that, that God has, has placed over you. Um, so, and it, was, it would be something, too, where, you know, sort of we look at different relationship with churches, and by and large, in the early centuries, what we see is when there are churches sort of getting involved in each other's business, it's typically as kind of a court of appeals. It's a, hey, big church who's been, you know, around longer than we have and has great, uh, great leaders and, and very wise people. How do we deal with this issue? Um, that, that was what it was. It wasn't like sort of a direct um, kind of a, a line of authority uh, flowing down. Um, but of course, as, uh, as time went on, uh, pastors or, or, or bishops of, of bigger churches were thought of to be greater, uh, to be greater than, than bishops of small churches. And I think that's uh, very much a temptation for us too today. You know, if you're, you know, kind of pastors meet up from, you know, different parts of the world, they'll, you know, one of the first things they'll establish is like, you know, who has the bigger congregation. And, you know, we, we probably wouldn't say it, but there, there's, uh, I, I think we do kind of assume that, oh, okay, well, bigger church must be a, you know, a better pastor or, or something like that, which um, we would argue strongly that that is not the case. Uh, however, that is something that can, that can creep into our, to our thinking, but it was no different in the early church. Um, so again, bishops in big churches and big cities and powerful cities were thought of as being sort of higher up on this, uh, higher up on the scale there. And eventually it would, it would sort of come to a point where it was thought of that, that power very much flows from the top down. Um, there, was, there was sort of this, this, this structure that would, uh, that would show up there, um, this, this accumulating power. And, and Rome, of course, uh, would ultimately be thought of, again, we think of the Roman Catholic Church as that being sort of the, you know, the head of, of the whole thing is, is in Rome there and with the Pope and, and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, again, it was the capital city. So it was the biggest church in the capital city of the biggest empire. There was where all the, you know, sort of the clout was, and that was, um, that was just where all the power was. Um, and actually, it was as early as, um, as the year 250 that uh, Pope Stephen, uh, who was uh, a bis the bishop of Rome at the time, claimed that he was the rock on which the church is built. Um, appealing back to Matthew, where um, Peter confesses uh, who Christ is, he confesses the identity of Christ, and then uh, Jesus responds with, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So that was the year 250 uh, that uh, the bishop of Rome claimed, uh, essentially, that you know, he is then, as the successor of Peter, he is the one uh, now, now building the church. Um, now that said, most of the rest of the church did not listen to Pope Stephen at the time. Um, they, uh, judging by several letters that were passed around, he seemed uh, to be quite full of himself, according to, um, according to others who were around at the time. So th that claim was made, uh, but it wasn't necessary. It certainly was nothing even close to a universal understanding of the church or anything like that. And, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. But, um, but that was uh, as early as 250 that it was claimed that, uh, that Rome or um, that Peter and Peter's successor was, was the rock on which the church was built. Um, and it's also interesting, too, is that, that Rome would eventually become uh, the most powerful, uh, you know, the most powerful church, but not one that was recognized by the East. Um, so if you remember, I'll actually, I have it in a couple slides here where we'll bring up the map of, of the ancient Roman Empire. And what's interesting, too, is, is when, you, when you look at everything, you can see where all these big, important cities are. There's Rome over here in the West, and then there's pretty much every other big church, Jerusalem and Antioch and Alexandria and all these other places are all in the East. And the Eastern churches primarily uh, didn't really care so much what, uh, what Rome was saying or what the bishop of Rome was saying. Um, again, Rome was the only, the only major city in the West at that time. And, uh, and as, as it functioned as such, more, more and more power would eventually sort of begin to flow to, uh, to Rome. 
Uh, and fast forwarding several centuries, um, there is a, a Pope Leo the Great, um, who was, uh, was Pope from 440 to 461. He was, I think most Protestants would probably argue that he was really the first actual Pope. Um, Rome, of course, claims that they have, you know, Popes going all the way back to, uh, to the Apostle Peter. But Pope Leo was the first one who really ever did any sort of, sort of popish um, things. Um, he, he claimed that, uh, that he was sort of at the top of the church and that all authority flowed downward to him. Um, again, still in, in the, uh, this would have been the, the fifth century, not a whole lot of people were necessarily listening to, uh, to those claims. Uh, however, Pope Leo did uh, do some quite remarkable things, and it, it sort of marked a big uh, shift in the church. So this is, uh, again, 440 to 461 is when he was. We'll say more on him when we, uh, when we get to that era. But uh, one of the big things that he did is he was around at a time right before uh, the fall of Rome. Uh, if you're very familiar with world history, uh, 476 is the year that most historians credit to the fall of Rome. So he was several decades before that. So Rome was on very shaky grounds. Rome was about to fall. And on two different occasions, uh, Italy was about to be invaded. Rome was about to uh, completely fall. And uh, Pope Leo uh, went out and met and through diplomacy prevented Rome from being destroyed on two different occasions, uh, once with the Huns and once with the Vandals. He went and negotiated for the people. And that was really sort of the origin of uh, the Pope or the Bishop of Rome being looked at as not just a spiritual leader, but also a political leader. And again, it was sh very shortly after this time that Rome, as we know it, would fall. Um, and of course, when you have this uh, this sort of power vacuum of there, there's been this huge uh, govern, governmental entity that crumbles. Uh, the church then was sort of the thing that would, that would sort of hold society together. Um, so that marks a big shift there. But that's, again, several hundred years ahead of where, of where we are here. Um, but again, it was, it was that event that, that really um, started a lot of people of, of seeing the pope, again, as not just a uh, spiritual leader, but as a, as a political leader. Um, I'm going to quote Origen real quick here. This is interesting. So Origen, who we read about uh, last week, who uh, got a number of things wrong, but he, uh, he would have been, so uh, again, I, I um, remarked that Pope Stephen around 250 was claiming that he was the rock on which um, the church was built. But Origen said this, and Origen would have said this um, around that time, probably shortly before, uh, before this time. Origen said this. He said, And if we too have said, like Peter, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, not as if flesh and blood have revealed it to us, but by the light from the Father in heaven, having shown in our heart, we have become a Peter. And to us there might be said by the word, Thou art Peter, etc. For a rock is every disciple of Christ in whom those who drank the, drank the drink of spiritual rock which followed them. And upon every such rock is built every word of the church." and the polity in accordance with it. For in each of us perfect, who have the combination of words and deeds and thoughts which fill up the blessedness, is the church built by God. Oh, so that's just quite interesting that that was around that same time that Rome started to, uh, to make that claim that they were the rock on which the church was built. Uh, Origen certainly did not follow that. and He was you know, certainly one of the most influential church leaders uh, around at that time. Um, so, so that's kind of how this, uh, this hierarchical uh, thinking applies to this particular topic of, uh, of the bishop here. And uh, the next thing we are going to look at is how this thinking then would get into thoughts regarding saints. Thoughts regarding saints. So saints, biblically, hagios, meaning holy one. Uh, the way the New Testament uses the word saints is... Um, it really is, is just, it's a very common Pauline greeting. When Paul, in particular, addresses um, Christians, he typically refers to them as saints. Um, you think just about a, a, any letter that he opens, he says, to the saints in such and such a place, you know, grace and peace to you. Um, so when the, when the New Testament, in particular, speaks of saints, it is speaking of Christians. We're saints not because we've done such and such things, but because we are Christ's. We belong to him. We've been saved by him. We've been, um, we are, are being sanctified uh, by him. Um, but a similar way to how, um, again, it's the word for, for in Christ or, or a Christian, we would say uh, a saint. Um, but in a similar way to how uh, the words uh, bishop uh, bishop and elder would be split apart. 
sort of in the, in the centuries, uh, the later centuries of the early, the early church period, um, the word saint would also kind of come to not, not so much be split, but it would come to refer to something else. It would come to refer to a unique class of Christian, sort of a, a set-apart um, set Christian, a special class. Um, we, we can see from early on that the, the early church held a very high view, uh, particularly of martyrs. Um, many, uh, many churches would eventually be built on the tombs of saints, uh, for example. Um, we can think of uh, Polycarp, who was uh, one, of those, one of those very early martyrs. There is uh, uh, February 23rd is uh, St. Is Polycarp's Day. Um, which is kind of interesting, but but just Christians since since very early on have set aside time to remember those who have done uh, great things for the kingdom of God. So in its origin, you know, setting aside a day to remember Polycarp uh, wasn't sort of some vain idolatrous thing. It was, hey, Polycarp was a great Christian. He was a great church leader, and we should remember him. So let's you know this this day of the year comes along. Let's let's remember uh, how God used this man. Um, but, but eventually, throughout the centuries, um, that, that would grow to become something much more than that. Uh, much more than that. Um, if you're familiar at all with, uh, for example, the, um, the history of Halloween or sort of how that relates to um, like the, um, uh, the Protestant Reformation and things like that, you would have, uh, eventually there were so many saints where it was, it was almost something where, you know, it was, a, it was a weird day if it wasn't a day that was dedicated to, uh, to whatever saint. And um, again, kind of on the, on the theme of like Halloween, Halloween is, um, is, is the night before all saints sort of a, well, we, we, there's only so many days in the year and we have a ton of saints who have died, so let's just pick one day and let's celebrate all of them. We'll call it All Saints Day. Uh, and then the next day would then become All Souls Day. Well, you know, not just the saints, but let's, let's remember all souls and let's, let's pray for them. And, and that was one of the big things that the, uh, the Protestant reformers in the 16th century would, would, really, um, would really reverse. They said, no, there's just, there's all this stuff, this has turned into idolatry, and it's something where we don't even really know well, the common people don't even know what to celebrate anymore. Okay, we celebrate, uh, you know, for example, Christ's resurrection on, on Easter, and, and of course on Sundays in general we celebrate those in a special way, but it's like every other day is dedicated to somebody. Let's, let's just get rid of all this. Let's just look to Christ. Let's just, um, let's just focus on him. Um, so that, that would be something that would be uh, eventually reversed or, or corrected by, um, by the Reformers. Um, they saw it again as sort of taking the focus off of Christ, taking the focus off of, uh, of his completed work. Um, but as we, as we think back to the, the hierarchical thinking, we think of, um, you know, we can, we can look to some of these saints, we can look to, to people like Polycarp and think, you know, I mean, are, are they not more holy than we are? Um, you know, again, if we're, if we're seeing all of life as this hierarchy, this, this power structure, um, you know, it makes sense that it would be, um, th that, it would be that way. Um, you know, again, thinking back to Polycarp. Polycarp did a lot of uh, a lot of great things. He did much for the church, and uh, certainly he was more sanctified than uh, than many other Christians. So it, it is just easy to um, to sort of slip into that of thinking, okay, this is a special category of of, of person. And uh, and of course, eventually, it would become much harder to make a uh, to make it to sainthood. The the later uh, church in the Middle Ages would add, you know, he had to have so many you know miracles, and you know there was. Typically, uh, you know, large donations involved and, and things like that. And th there was certainly corruption that would, that would come in over the centuries. But um, again, in its, uh, in, its early, in its early days, it was, it was started as just a, hey, let's remember people who have done, uh, who have done great things. Um, well, where we are sort of gearing towards uh, and where we have been sort of gearing towards the last couple of weeks is we've been leading up to the, uh, the fourth century, that is the 300s. And uh, in the 300s, um, there would be this, this great shift where Christianity would become legalized. Uh, again, we've not gotten to that. We'll get to that next, actually in two weeks, uh, we will get to that. But uh, with that, with the legalization of Christianity that was coming, um, there would also be uh, an emergence of this idea of praying to a saint to appeal to God for you. Um, this, uh, and, and people would argue that this is biblical. For example, uh, James 5.16 says, the prayer of, a righteous, of the righteous avails much. 
fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. So th- this idea of, uh, of praying to the saints would really, would really sort of start to emerge uh, in that time in the, in the fourth century. Um, and again, when we think back to uh, what we discussed earlier with the, this idea of a patron, it's like, well, if, if we have, you know, if I'm down here and, uh, you know, and I can access this saint who's up here and he's, he's holier than I am, you know, he's not as holy as God, of course, but he's higher up on the food chain. Uh, you know, he might have a little bit more weight, uh, you know, if he's, if he's appealing to, to God. So initially it was, um, it was sort of praying the saints to pray for us. Um, was, uh, was kind of what that was. Now, there's, of course, theological problems with that, uh, theological problems all over the place. Um, you know, for, for example, one of the glaring ones being, well, how can saints hear us? Um, you know, we, we don't have anything biblically to point to saints being, becoming omniscient or something when they die. So this idea of, okay, well, how do we, how do we pray to the saints? And, uh, you, you know, there's just, there's a number of, of issues there. But um, that, that was sort of the, the justification for it. That was the, the reasoning behind it. Um, it kind of had to do with these, uh, uh, this, this patronage, this patronage on this hierarchy. And uh, again, why not appeal to someone who's higher up in the food chain? Again, if you're trying to get this building built and you're having trouble with the government, you know, okay, I've got this friend in high places, let me, you know, kind of uh, see what I can do to make a deal with him and see if he can, he can sort of plead my cause and, and advance, uh, advance things for me. And uh, this is really kind of how Mary will also uh, come to be elevated. Um, this idea that, uh, that Mary is, um, you know, again, she's, she's holier than we are, but she's still, uh, she's accessible. She's, um, right, she's a mother. She's, she's very understanding. And um, she also has this incredibly close connection uh, with Christ. Um, so if we really want uh, if we really want Christ to hear our prayers, who better to make an appeal to him than his own mother? Um, this, is, uh, this is, again, this is sort of the appeal of it. Now, again, this isn't biblical. There, there's nothing, right, in, in Scripture that would, that would lead us to believe that we can, you know, pray to Mary and have her uh, get, you know, some, some sort of a, of a prayer granted or something like that from Christ. Um, again, it's not, it's not really very biblical of theology, but this is, uh, this is sort of how the thinking would come in here. Ephesians 2, 17 says, And he came and preached peace to you, you who are far off, and peace to those who are near, who were near. For through him we both have access to, in one spirit to the Father. So the, the, really how we can, we can sort of combat this with Scripture is, that, is, is by understanding that um, it's because of what Christ has accomplished and because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside us. This is how we have access to God. We don't need these, these other mediums. We don't need uh, saints or Mary or, or any of these other, uh, these other people. We can appeal directly to God because of what Christ has done on the cross, because his mediating work in us, because of the Holy Spirit that he has poured out on us. So th- this would be our, um, our response to, uh, to this sort of thinking. Um, and I think a lot of times, um, again, we're not, we're not going to dive much heavier than that into uh, at least stuff with Mary. But I think as, as Protestants in particular, we're tempted to sort of have the wrong reaction to Mary. Um, we can kind of see like any, like, I, I, I'm just curious, has anyone ever heard, a, listen to a sermon on Mary specifically? Cup one. One okay, yeah. So it's I, I just think that that's you know the pendulum can kind of swing the other way the other way where we see um, you know frankly things that that look very idolatrous particularly in um, in the Roman Catholic Church and so we can we can sort of almost swing the pendulum too far and say okay well, we don't need anything to do with Mary and and I think we need to have a balanced response to that Mary is of course a, a great example of a young godly Christian woman um, who who trusts in Christ. Um, and uh, again, we just we want to have a balanced uh, a balanced view uh, of that. Um, but certainly, she would be very much um, uplifted by uh, particularly uh, the church in Rome, the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church as well, but but primarily by Rome. Um, along with that, along with this idea of um, the saints, uh, would come the the ideas of relics and icons. 
Uh, so for example, uh, the, the early church, even going back to the early period, um, would have a high view of the bodies of their martyrs. Uh, so for example, when, um, when, when someone would be martyred, the church would, would very often try to go and collect the body to, uh, you know, to bury it or to honor it or, or something like that. Um, but eventually, this sort of turned into relics where, um, you know, even the bones of, of believing uh, of Christians who were martyred uh, would be thought to have some sort of a spiritual significance, some sort of a, a spiritual power. Maybe if you... <laughs> I don't know if you think I have, you know, St. Peter's femur, then I can get his ear quicker or, or something like that. You know, that's, uh, it sounds silly, but that's, that's kind of what it would be. There, there's a, no, a number of different relics um, and on uh, icons. Icons would be uh, something more done by the church in the East, um, but, but icons, you know, portraits, paintings of saints, things like that, things that would end up being used in worship. Um, and then relics would be these, um, these physical objects. And, uh, and again, it's sort of the, the mentality is that, well, if I have this artifact that, you know, belonged to some saint, then again, I can maybe get his ear a little bit quicker and he can bring my, uh, he can bring my appeal before God. Um, but unfortunately, this would, you know, not that it's good theology to start out with, but um, just as the, as the centuries would go on, by the time you get to the Reformation, there's just this huge uh, industry of relics, and, and people are always, you know, discovering, um, you know, original pieces from the cross that Christ was, uh, was killed on or, or something like that. It was um, <laughs> John Calvin remarked in, uh, in the 16th century that you could build a whole ship with the pieces of the cross that people had collected if you would just gather them all up. Because it's just, you know, people just find things. And, you know, again, it became this, it became a big, big business. You know, if you can say, oh, this thing, I can trace it back to, you know, whatever great Christian or, uh, or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I always like that remark from Calvin that you could build a whole ship with pieces of the cross. Um, but uh, things like this, use of, of things like images and icons um, was present fair, from fairly early on in the church. Um, for example, they found, um, they found the catacombs of Rome, which is where, where a number of Christians were, and, and you can look up different pictures of it, but uh, many of the early Christians did use um, things like relics and icons. Now, they probably did not attribute any of the significance to it that the, the church in the Middle Ages would. Um, but it, it, was, uh, it was present uh, in at least some, uh, and it was also controversial uh, with some. For example, both uh, Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian, who we learned about last week, uh, were very strongly against the use of any sort of images in worship. Um, and um, they, they, they wrote against that um, quite strongly, and that would have been in the second century. Um, there was even uh, those, again, it was really in the 4th century that a lot of this stuff would, would really find its way into the church, but there, were, um, there was one, um, uh, one, one church father uh, who argued that images and icons and artifacts were just another pagan deviation from true biblical worship, uh, and he would argue that in the 4th century. All right, so that is kind of in a nutshell where, where saints are. And now let's uh, go to changing politics and changing sort of social shifts. So we're going to kind of skip back to, uh, to where we were last week and kind of get back in the, uh, the third century, in the 200s AD, and we're going we're to kind of close out this, this century a little bit with some, some things that, that happened in then. So if you, uh, if, you, if you remember where we were, we talked about uh, around 250 was when the worst persecution against the church up at that time had happened. Um, there was, uh, there was one, one emperor in particular who uh, came against the church very strongly, came, across, came against it on a universal scale that is empire-wide. Uh, persecutions prior to 250 were there. They were kind of sporadic. They were mostly regional. Uh, by and large, if Christians wanted to um, you know, flee persecution, there was probably somewhere that they could go to sort of flee that. But that wasn't really the case with the persecution in 250. Um, we saw the things that, that led to that persecution was, uh, was the thousandth anniversary of Rome several years prior to that. And uh, the Christians universally did not participate in that. And uh, because of that, the thought was that uh, the Christians had angered the gods, and then this is then their retribution as, um, you know, the government starts to collapse. Things politically look very shaky for Rome, and of course the Christians 
are the ones who, who face the, the blame for that. Um, so around the year 250 was when, uh, when that persecution took off. Uh, again, the empire looked weak. Uh, the church following that persecution in the decades to come uh, looked quite weak. If you remember, there was uh, a number of Christians who had either uh, given in and sacrificed to pagan gods, uh, or there were Christians who had uh, bribed some sort of official to obtain a document saying that they had, uh, they had sacrificed to uh, such and such a god. So the church was not, uh, not in real great shape there. Uh, there were, of course, many great Christian leaders. Uh, Origen, for example, who we learned about last week, uh, died in that persecution. Um, there, there were many who were faithful, but there were also many who were, who were not faithful. Uh, but again, the church was very weak from empire-wide uh, persecution. Uh, in the centuries following sort of the 250 to 300, uh, there were a number of power struggles politically. There were a number of different revolts. Um, there were uh, threats from without Rome. Uh, that is, there were threats from Persia, um, from the Germanic tribes. Things were just not, um, not looking great. And uh, in response to that, um, well, Rome had also become very difficult to manage. Uh, Rome was a very large empire, and their structure had been more or less top-down. Again, sort of that just sort of basic hierarchy of, okay, you have Caesar and you have, you know, everybody kind of under him. Uh, well, one of the things they did in response to that difficulty to manage was they, uh, they provided an, a number of governmental reforms. Uh, one of the things that they did is they divided the empire into east and west, um, and they had co-emperors who were called Augustuses, Augustuses, who were under them, and then under each of those Augustuses, they had a junior emperor who they referred to as a Caesar. So basically what they were doing is they are just kind of down-tiering the level of responsibility. So sort of, you know, we could, we could think about that today in terms of uh, maybe comparing like a state government with a national government, right? It's just, it's not efficient for uh, a nation like the United States to be sort of micromanaged from Washington, right? You need local control. You need uh, the states to have their own autonomy. You need county governments and, you know, and things like that. So um, that, that was sort of what, what Rome was doing in their, uh, in their attempts to, uh, to reform. Um, and these reforms strengthened the empire. They kind of turned things around. Again, Rome went from in a very, uh, very rough place in the in the 250s to by the time uh, you know the the end of that century would um, would come, they they looked much stronger. Um, but then in 303, so getting into the fourth century there, in 303, a new Roman emperor uh, took the throne named Diocletian. Um, and he would launch what would then be the new worst persecution that the church would face. Um, so in 303 uh, was when that, uh, when that began, and he gave four different edicts. Uh, and again, these would be uh, empire-wide. This was, uh, there, there had been a time of probably 30 or 40 years of relative peace with the church. That is uh, when the, the government was not actively hunting down Christians, 30 or 40 years, and then, uh, and then it started back up uh, under Diocletian uh, in 303. These four edicts uh, that were against the church was this. Uh, number one was church buildings and Bibles would be destroyed and Christian worship was forbidden. Uh, number two, Christian clergy were arrested and imprisoned. Three, clergy must sacrifice to the gods or be tortured. And then four, all citizens in general must sacrifice to the gods or be executed. Um, so kind of comparing and contrasting this persecution with the last one, that is the one of the early 300s to the 250s, Many left the church in 250. Again, the, the church in 250 was not, um, not incredibly strong. Uh, the church dealt with the persecution much better in 303. Um, sort of in response to uh, people walking away from the Christian faith, there were just a lot of, a, a lot of Christian leaders who um, would just really encourage just a, a moral vigor and um, just, just sort of standing up under persecution. And again, the church was, was much more faithful uh, in that, uh, that last persecution starting in, um, in 303. Um, there, Christians were very faithful. There was not much widespread apostasy. Again, many Christians, of course, were, uh, were executed and killed, but they were much more faithful than the time, uh, the time before. Trivia question. Anybody know what the first Christian empire, what, or not empire, the first Christian nation was? Anybody? I'm not calling on you. Um, <laughs> Um, that, was, uh, that was the nation uh, or the kingdom of Armenia. 
Armenia. And that was due to, and I'll, I'll close with this here, there was a, a, a man, an evangelist, uh, known as Gregory the Illuminator. Gregory the Illuminator, who was uh, in the year 240 to 332. And he was someone who would evangelize uh, to uh, the people of Armenia, and specifically to the king and the royal family of Armenia. Um, and that's, this is, the, um, this is the, the image that I had from last week. Um, so I guess kind of going back to an earlier point, and then I'll circle back around there. But I kind of mentioned earlier that uh, most of the important cities uh, were in the east here, um, right? You've got Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, uh, Athens. Uh, you know, the, these are the, the very, um, the, the, the big churches at the time. And then you have, you know, all the way over here is Rome. So it, it's kind of divided. You know, your really important cities are mostly over here, and then there's one over there. So that kind of points to how Rome would, would accumulate the power that they eventually would. But um, way over here is where Armenia is. So Armenia is kind of in a, in a crossroads there, um, right? You've got Africa down here, you've got Europe over here, and then you've got Asia over here. So they're kind of this crossroads um, neighbor. So they're an independent nation. They're not part of the Roman, uh, not part of the Roman government. Um, this is uh, again kind of zooming in here. So it would have been, yeah, the Roman Empire would have come up here, the Parthians over here, um, and then there's this this kingdom of Armenia um, that's uh, that's in the middle. But again, Gregory the Illuminator was the one who brought the gospel to Armenia. He was uh, seemingly an Armenian himself, not to be confused with an Armenian. Um, <laughs> he was uh, he was an Armenian. Two of you got that. Um, that's all right. Um, but again, he evangelized to the king and converted the royal family, and it was really just sort of a, of a top-down effort. Um, around the year 300, uh, Armenia would become the first Christian nation. And uh, the, their history is, is super interesting because they're still, um, though they've been through much, if you're familiar with their history at all, in terms of being occupied at different times. There was a, a horrible genocide uh, about a century ago in Armenia. However, um, Armenia is still uh, formally a Christian, Christian people, Christian nation. Um, so yeah, kind of interesting. So all the way from um, you know, the year 300, here we are over 1,700 years later, and there is still that um, Still, that that faithfulness there. Um, and obviously, we're going to. They they look more, much more like an Eastern Orthodox type of church. Um, certainly, we're not going to hold all the same, you know, beliefs and, and things like that. But um, it's just it's cool to see the way that uh, that God has preserved them through the centuries, throughout um, just all the the various upheavals and um, and political difficulties that they have there. <clears throat> 